Howdy guys, welcome to, I guess we'll call this digital midweek. Welcome to my office and my baseball chair. Uh, you can tell I am uh, still morning baseball season. We should be playing baseball right now. It's not happening, but I'm going to trust that to the Lord and, and uh, get over it. But next Wednesday, I do want to tell you about something really, really cool. Hopefully you already know this, and I'm sure some of you do because you're great Texans. Next Wednesday is Texas Independence Day. And by goodness gracious, we're going to celebrate that together. So guess what our theme is for the night? The theme for Wednesday night is Texas. I want y'all to come out, come out decked in all of your Texas gear. Fly flags, wear cowboy hats and boots the whole nine yards. I will probably whip up some sort of wonderful Texas treat for us to enjoy together. And of course, we're going to continue on studying our study of what would Jesus do. But this is too easy and should be a whole lot of fun. We might even give the most Texan award. I won't win that award. I'll make sure it's given to somebody else. Uh, but uh, will. it'll be a really, really great night. But that's next Wednesday. I'm sorry we can't meet today. Although if you've stuck your nose out for longer than 10 seconds, you know it's really, really bad cold and super gross. And it's smart that we're not meeting. Um, but I am. I'm sorry about that because I miss you guys terribly. I did want to spend a little bit of time in the Word together. You have at least tomorrow with no school, so you've got time to look at this. It's not going to be a full-blown sermon for me, though, so stick with me. Let's dive in. John chapter 2. We're going to look at a little bit of John chapter 2, a little bit of John chapter 3, a little bit of John chapter 4. Again, this series is What Did Jesus Do? If we know the things that Jesus did, then we can know what we're supposed to be doing in a lot of scenarios. So check out the end of chapter 2. Uh, verse 23, it says, Now when he was in Jerusalem, talking about Jesus, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs uh, that he was doing. Now remember, we looked at this last week. When Jesus, excuse me, went to the Passover feast, the first thing he did as he walked into the temple, he looked around, he made a whip, and he whipped out the people that had set up shops and were selling animals and changing money in the court of Gentiles, making it incredibly hard for Gentiles especially, to come and to pray and worship the Lord. And that was a massive problem. It made Jesus angry. So Jesus booted all those people out. As you can imagine, a lot of people thought that was pretty cool. When it says here that people were believing in Jesus because of the signs that he was doing, we don't know what all he did that week, but we know for sure he did one thing, and that was he took to task people and some of them would have been Jewish, and some of them would not have been Jewish, took to task the people that were making it harder to worship and that were cheating other people. By and large, people would have gone, that's pretty awesome. Now, the money changers didn't like it so much, but everyone else would have gone, I like that guy. That guy's cool. I'm on his team. Yay, Jesus, right? And so as a result, they were believing in him. They were cheering him on. They were giving him glory. Now, in and of itself, that sounds pretty great, but watch this. It says specifically, Jesus, verse 24, Jesus didn't, did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people and he needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. In other words, he's looking in their hearts and he's realizing their faith isn't real. They like what I do, but they don't necessarily like who I am yet because they don't know who I am yet. Check it out. The takeaway for us here is there are going to be times in your life when other people are going to cheer you on and think that you're great because of something awesome that you did. But the second that you take a stand for Christ, or maybe not necessarily for Christ, just a stand for what's right, and all of a sudden people that thought you were great 10 minutes ago aren't going to care for you so much because you're not doing anything for them anymore. And that's exactly what's about to happen to Jesus. Over and over and over again, we're going to see this play out. Jesus does a miracle and people think he's great. And then he teaches something. Specifically, he's going to point out people's sins or call them to, to change or to do something for the Lord. And they're going to go, yeah, I don't want to do that. I'm out. And so when it says here he didn't entrust himself to them, it literally just means that he's not relying on their glory of him. His sole purpose and motivation in his life is to glory his, glorify his Father and to do the right thing. And that's our, our role too. And I just shut my Bible. That was funny. Yeah, that's all we're supposed to be striving for, guys, is seeking to please God and none other. And by the way, the reason why we love Jesus it's not that we don't love Jesus for the things that he does. Our biggest reason for loving Jesus is the fact that he saved us, right? That's huge. We trust him that he's God because he rose from the dead. So it's not just that we deny his miracles. In fact, the opposite. 
but we also love Jesus because of who he is. And we follow and obey Jesus because of who he is. Because watch this. There are going to be times in life when you're going to love Jesus with all your heart because he did something awesome for you. Like he saved you or he provided for you or he helped you with a test or whatever. Something that you prayed for is going to happen. And you're going to go, yay, Jesus, you're the best. And then later on in your life, something is going to go poorly. And you're going to go, I don't like you, Jesus. I'm mad at you. Are you going to read something in here and you're going to go, I disagree, Jesus. I'm mad at you. And it's not that he doesn't care. He does. But he's no less God when we decide to disobey him. He's not stuck on our glorifying of him. He's no less powerful. He's, he doesn't feel bad about himself. He doesn't weep in the corner whenever um, we're not worshiping him or we're mad at him about something that he's done. Because that's not his motive and his goal in life. His goal in life is to glorify his father. As I promise you, there are going to be times when you're not going to like something Jesus said or did. That's no reason to stop following him, but just understand your goal, our purpose, what we're supposed to be seeking to do is glorifying Jesus above all else. And our faith in him can't be just in the things that he does for us. It's got to be also built in who he is. And he's God, and he knows everything, and he's holy, and he's always right, which means we can always trust him even when we don't necessarily like the outcome or how scenarios going. So that's what's going on at the end of chapter 2. You keep rolling into chapter 3. Here's my challenge to you guys. I want you to read chapter 3 on your own. And I would love for you to text me one or two things that jumped out at you. But let me point out a couple of things just really, really quick to you. I love the fact that verse 2, this is when Jesus, uh, sorry, Nicodemus comes to Jesus. We've watched the, the chosen episode of this. You've, you've read this chapter before. Don't just skip through it because you, you were anxious to get to verse 16, although verse 16 is really, really great. Really look at some of this stuff. Um, Nicodemus comes to Jesus, and verse 2 tells us specifically that Nicodemus came to Jesus at night. Now, it doesn't say what at night meant. It just means dark. That could be like, I don't know, 6 p.m. It could be midnight. We're honestly not sure. But because it's nighttime, that meant that it was an inconvenience. At best, that means it's supper time, right? When you're eating supper or you're finally down for the evening, you're just kind of relaxed. You're not necessarily, and you're not expecting company. It can be a little bit of an inconvenience when somebody shows up and says, hey, can we, can we talk? But that happens, doesn't it? You're needed. Jesus was needed in this moment. And, and it wasn't, by the way, just because Nicodemus was an important person. There would be other people that are going to interrupt Jesus. We're going to see this often. But Jesus made himself available despite the fact that it was inconvenient because his father was going to gain great glory for it. Now, there's some caveats to that. Do we always have to be on call? No. In fact, there are times when it's appropriate to tell someone, no, I, I can't meet right now. Yesterday was a good example for me. Yesterday was Becca's birthday. And so, because it was Becca's birthday, I didn't go to any student events yesterday. And there were some, some events, some really cool events that I could have gone to. And now, it's going to have ice for a couple days, so I'm going to miss that. However, the right thing for me to do, and will always be for me to do, is always make Becca first, because she's my wife. And then my children on top of that, right? It's not that I don't love you guys, love you dearly, I just love Becca and my kids more. Y'all understand that, your parents treat you the same way, at least I hope they do. There are going to be times when it's right to say, no, I can't meet right now. But there's also going to be lots of times when, when it's going to be inconvenient, but God is still calling us to go and do ministry. So check that out. Watch that. The other thing I think is pretty neat here, too, Jesus speaks to Nicodemus in a way that he generally doesn't talk to other people. And I think it's because of Nicodemus' background. Nicodemus is a very intelligent man. He's a very biblically minded man. And so Jesus appeals to Nicodemus with the scriptures in ways that he doesn't do with other people. Here's my point. As you are ministering to other people, it can't always be cookie cutter. As you're sharing the gospel with other people, there's lots and lots of great tools to share the gospel with some with other people, and I, I've been trained in a lot of those. But you can't use it the same way every single time because everybody's different and everybody's got a different background. The trick is to follow the Spirit of God. And praise God, he promised that the Spirit of God will tell us what we need to say when these ministry opportunities come up. But don't feel like you have to be trapped in a, okay, I first have to talk about Romans chapter 3, and I have to talk about Romans chapter 6, and I have to go to chapter 9, and then I might want to go back to Genesis, and then come back to chapter 11. No, no, no. Trust the Spirit of God and what you're supposed to say to the individuals who are coming to you, again, even and probably especially when it's in an inconvenient time. 
And then the last thing, chapter 4. I think this is pretty cool. Jesus and his disciples are out baptizing people. Remember, we we saw John the Baptist last week. John the Baptist is baptizing people. Now Jesus and his disciples are doing the same thing. The end of chapter 3, because you're going to read this, you'll see this. John's disciples start to notice that less people are coming to them and more and more people are going to, to Jesus. And so John's disciples say, hey, isn't that a, like a problem? Aren't you sad about that? And John says, no, I'm thrilled about that because he's supposed to increase and I'm supposed to decrease. Catch that. That's really, really important. But back to chapter 4. It tells us in chapter 4, Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed and again went to Galilee. Here's what I want you to catch. This might seem insignificant, but it's not. It tells us that Jesus, he himself, didn't baptize anybody, although he and his disciples were out baptizing people. Why does that matter? In fact, you might be going, that sounds kind of weird. Why wouldn't Jesus baptize somebody? I think there's two reasons for it. Number one, and this is really the simple answer, it would be super easy to get cocky and go, <laughs> Jesus, baptized me. You only got baptized by Jesus. You're a scumbag, but I'm the best because Jesus baptized me. Jesus, again, he knows men's hearts. And so he let all his, his, all his disciples do the baptizing. So that would be the first aspect. By the way, you're going, would people really argue over who baptized them? Go to the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 1 and chapter 2. That's exactly what they were arguing over. No, Paul baptized me. Well, John baptized me. Peter baptized me. And, and Paul says, it doesn't matter. So, yes, people argued about that. In fact, one of the funniest verses in the whole Bible, again, in 1 Corinthians, chapter 1, Paul actually says, I thank God I didn't baptize any of you because you're bickering like a bunch of babies. Anyway, come back here. Number two and probably the more important reason, the reason why Jesus didn't baptize anyone, he was letting his disciples do that. More specifically, Jesus empowered his disciples to do ministry. Now, FYI, doing a baptism is not hard. It's not the easiest thing. You do need to practice. In fact, at the seminary just down the street, there's a special baptistry so that new pastors can practice the art of baptizing people. But it's not necessarily a hard thing, but it's a very important thing. And Jesus taught his disciples how to baptize the people. And then he said, okay, go do it. Guys, Jesus empowers people for ministry. And remember, most of the disciples, pretty young dudes, teenagers, guess what? He's empowering you to do ministry right now. And they might feel sometimes like insignificant, not big deals, but it's ministry, so it always matters. You Blessing other people in Jesus' name always matters. That's the stuff that he wants you to be doing, and he's given you the opportunity and the ability and the spiritual empowerment to do it. So watch for opportunities to serve the kingdom. Guys, I love you so, so much. I am so, so sad, again, that we're not together tonight. But I'm going to blow the, the little whistle. We don't actually have to stack chairs, but it feels weird not to end any other way. So... I love y'all. I'll see you next week, and uh, y'all stay warm. Bye.